Hello, and thank you for joining. This is the latest episode in a series from the Apex Alliance. Apex Alliance are a group of best-of-breed UK Microsoft Gold partners working together to deliver total digital transformation. We are made up of IntelliJ, Preact, TES and Wellingtone. IntelliJ is a Microsoft Gold certified partner with expertise in Office 365, SharePoint and Nintex. Preact help businesses of all sizes maximize the value of Dynamics 365. TES specializes in delivering Microsoft Dynamics NAV and Microsoft 365 Business Central information systems on-site or in the cloud. Wellingtone is the partner of choice for organizations looking to take a step change in their project and portfolio management maturity. I'm Liam Harrison, Practice Lead for Process Automation at IntelliJ. And this webinar is really to give a brief introduction to process automation and how it links to digital transformation. Now, digital transformation is the hot topic right now. But it's not just a one-time thing, just a quick, like, we're going to transform now. With the evergreen software landscape right now, there is constant opportunity to take advantage of new features. That means that people just don't stick with systems for the long term like they used to. And even when we do, those platforms, take Office 365 for example, are constantly evolving with new features and solutions. There's no longer the option to wait for Service Pack 1. You have to move and adapt with the software. Now it's quite easy to say, well, I'm not just going to jump in. I'm not going to take that risk. What we've got works for us. It makes sense. It's cautious, methodical. That's the right way to run a business, right? The problem is, new solutions mean new opportunities. And the fact is, if you're not taking the opportunities, then someone else is. And that's not how to run a business. Digital transformation isn't just a change of systems or moving to the cloud. It's a mindset shift. Because digital transformation is ongoing. You become a digitally transformative organisation, taking the opportunities that technology offers you. And that means that you gain and retain a competitive edge by being able to react to industry changes, being able to react to technological change, being able to react to economic change. This digital business agility enables future growth, the viability of your business. If we look at a recent McKinsey study, process automation is one of the six key building blocks to develop digital capabilities. The initial investment you make in process automation when well implemented can scale quickly and without additional cost. Now, if you're familiar with BPM, it can seem like process automation works against some of the core tenets of digital transformation. BPM tends to be a bigger, heavier type of solution. Everything has to be squeezed into one way of doing things. Take tasks, for example. They all need to be routed through that BPM software. It's heavy. It creates a big reliance on one system, which decreases agility. Traditional BPM isn't really in line with a modern, agile approach to business. Done right though, process automation is the key to true digital transformation. Have a think about your system setup. Perhaps you've got a CRM, perhaps Office 365, maybe an ERP, maybe one of the core parts of your business has something custom. You of course have finance systems, and these could be any number of systems and they could change. It's the prerogative of the business to be able to change systems when necessary. True business agility comes from being able to adapt. As you work through a process automation program, you need to consider all these systems as moving pieces, and it's the processes that bind them all together. For example, imagine I work for a services company, perhaps one with a very entertaining practice lead. We have a CRM, we have Office 365, we have a few bespoke systems, and we have Zero to manage finance. If we take a look at the top view, a really zoomed out process of how the business functions, a sales lead comes into the business and is logged in CRM. Now that contact and that, that person in that organization works through a sales process and might or might not turn into a project, a customer. If it is, then obviously that needs to go onto whatever project management system you have and perhaps records and documents are stored in SharePoint. There's resourcing and finance, and all these points of intersection, there are processes to keep the data in sync, and those are some of the most labor-intensive, waste-of-time manual processes you will ever find. 
Often there's duplication of data and that's one of the most efficient things you can do. And invariably there are sort of Excel sheets being used in the background to manipulate and reformat the data as need be. And this is so clunky and error prone. And this is where you get the most value from automation. Project onboarding is a great example. That lead changes into a customer at this point and a project record is created. And some of the data from that lead needs to be transferred over. Not all of it, but some. The contract, for example, is a record of what the project will be. So that goes into the project documentation. Data needs to go to the project management system and finance for invoicing purposes. All this needs to happen quickly, efficiently and without error. There can be many of these little processes weaving their way between departments and systems, making up the backbone of your organisation. Remember, any one of these systems may change in the future. We could change to Salesforce or HubSpot. We might decide that that customised legacy version of Lotus Notes used for time logging isn't really up to scratch anymore. That's why process automation is the first thing you need to get in place. Set it up right and any future decisions you make in regard to systems should just slot right into place. We have a long history of success with automation projects and some of our most long-term customers have been using our process automation expertise for many years. The customers with the greatest success in their process automation projects tend to follow our advice in three particular areas. Number one, get buy-in. Yes, I do mean from a resource and financial perspective, but also from an organisational perspective. There's a huge culture shift that needs to run through the whole organisation. I need to make sure that everybody from the bottom up is on board with that. The best way to do that is to get a quick win. Getting a quick win shows results quickly. This is true to many projects, but it's especially true to process automation as it's not that familiar to business users. The good news is that it's especially feasible with process automation. You've got the ability to work in something that you can show is scalable. So you put yourself in a really good position. If I can automate one process, then I can automate any process within the business. And I can reap the benefits more easily because we have the skills in place to do it already. You need a good overview of what processes you have in place. And you need to select the ones that are going to bring the most value in the shortest amount of time with the smallest amount of spend. And that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. But it is vital. The other key thing about getting buy-in early is that people know their processes and you may not. Users are very used to the way we do things around here. That's why you end up with those spreadsheets supporting business processes that haven't been identified or aren't completely covered by a system. Very often there is little understanding of the complexities or the nuances of a particular process outside of the silo in which that process takes place. You need to make sure that the organisation as a whole is aware of what we're trying to achieve. So even though you may start off with a smaller or seemingly less important process, just to prove how it's working and get that quick win, you need to make sure that the team you're working with know how important this is and know that this is a vital part of the organizational strategy. During analysis works, these user groups, they need to know that they have a voice so that they give you genuine requirements and genuine feedbacks and you're giving them the best solution they can possibly get. A good example, we've been working with a pharmaceutical company for the last few years. We were first contacted by a systems analyst looking into automating their standard operating procedures. Now this is a very large, very formal process and there, I, we got the impression that they were nervous about SharePoint. So one of our key goals early on was to remove this nervousness. We found that this nervousness was coming from the IS manager and the director of business performance. So we got the right people round the table, ensuring we included everyone, and we uncovered another need within the business for a contracts management solution and suggested using this lower risk proof of concept. So again, we got more of the right people round the table, the day-to-day -day users. It's their system. Of course, there was an SOP to cover that process, but in my experience, procedures and policies, no matter how strict, leave room for nuance and details for the day-to-day -day workers to interpret. Any automation of that process needs to mirror that as organically as possible. 
So we had great success with that smaller project and because of that success we were able to move on to the larger project and gradually automate more and more throughout the business bringing more and more value. The second key area of process automation is to plan your work and work your plan. It's all about analysis and documentation. Now, as I mentioned, it's the implementation that has the biggest impact on company success. To do that successfully, you have to marry up two things. A business analysis of the situation and a technical design. Now, the business analyst needs to be the link back to the business requirements to ensure the processes are in line. And it needs to be blind to technology at first. You need to work with received requirements, but you need to challenge and test them using workshops and user journeys. And the output of this analysis are things like process maps and user stories and a list of requirements and acceptance criteria so that we've got a good foundation for the project to move forward. And then it's down to the analyst working with the architect, perhaps with some internal workshops, perhaps putting together some POCs and doing some R&D to find the best technical approach which fits the requirements. Good example here. Again, we've been working with a manufacturing company for a number of years and they have extremely complex change request requirements on Office 365. Now this is a core system. When this company came to us, they had already made the technical selection. And we know from experience that Office 365, especially at the time because it was quite young, can be a little tricky with the large scale deployments of automated workflows. So the planning of this work was extremely important. What we ended up with was over 50 workflows working with a master workflow. Now that seems like a huge amount. And now we had multiple master workflows working over the top of these workflows to make sure everything was ticking over fine. Because this is a core process, failing processes was not an option. So we need to manage any sort of failure to maximize uptime. One of the other issues we have was the number of concurrent workflows running at the same time. Because of the nature of the system, change requests all seemed to come in at the same time. And it would mean that the system became very overloaded. And in my Office 365, there was no way to increase the resources ourselves to make sure that that was coming in. So we designed the workflows in a way that would mitigate that and spread the load automatically. What was also key to this project was making a good selection on a workflow tool. It's a very, very fine balance. You need to be aware of what you have in place already. For example, if you have Office 365, then you're going to have access to Flow. And this is great for moving data from one place to the other and making quick, simple automation. Flow is perfectly usable, so there's no reason why you shouldn't use it. They've also got things like guided process flows in CRM. So you've already got that built-in functionality and it really keeps the cost down and that can lead to a better solution overall because you're picking and choosing where you use it. However, when you get an example like we had, where the requirements are over and above what you can do with the out-of-box tools, we have great experience working with third-party tools such as Nintex. Because no matter what tools you use that are built into products, you will come to a point where you need to step outside that field. There will be limits to what those native products can do. And you're going to find those limits quite quickly if you're embarking on a, on a full program of work. You're going to be pushing those tools to their limits. Now, Nintex is a third-party tool that started off in SharePoint many years ago, but they now have their own cloud-based proprietary workflow engine, which can connect to pretty much any systems. Nintex gives very, very complex and, and robust workflow capability. It gives great connectivity, but one of the key things it does is it has a real depth to its actions in terms of user interaction. And that is really where we come on to the last point that I'm going to go through. The third key fundamental of process automation is to think about the human side of things. Straight away, what am I talking about there? Well, the point of automation is to remove repetitive and error-prone elements. You have a process and you automate as much of it as you can. There will always remain something that you can't automate. There's always still that human element. And those can only be a few things, really. Information is needed from a user to give context to the process. A decision is needed 
one that has too many variables to be automated, and someone needs to be informed or notified of something. Now this can be, and it normally is, a com combination of all three. So that means a combination of data entry, data display, and event notification. What we also need to consider is the context. The context of the user, what their preferred device is, what their connectivity is like, and the context of the process, how urgent it is, how high value it is. Another quick example, we worked with a leading civil engineering firm. Have a look at this high level process map. This is the overview of how their material ordering process works. The key thing here is that we've got three environmental contexts. We've got a foreman, we've got back office and managerial. The foreman is in the field, back offices are in our office, and managerial sort of sometimes moves, sometimes don't. You can check out our YouTube channel for a video which goes into much more detail about this particular process and how we automated it. The key thing for each of these user groups is they were not getting a good experience. The foreman being out in the field with limited connectivity and OPC didn't have a good way to place orders and didn't have a good way to track orders. The back office only had basic solutions for data entry which resulted in errors. And managerial staff were not always office based. So it was hard to get the information they needed to make a decision. What they ended up doing was having a bi-weekly meeting to go through all of the approvals together and that was a massive bottleneck and a waste of resources. So we did three key things. We created an app for the foreman, a mobile app, which meant they were able to place orders easily, without error, on their mobile devices. And if there was no connectivity, that was no problem. It would just go into an outbox and sync up when they had connectivity. They also had the ability to keep track of orders right there in the app. Now we also created a SharePoint team site for the back office with proper, a proper collaborative workspace with a good clear interface and workflows in the background taking care of many of the repetitive tasks that were leading to errors. And we also automated all of the approvals for the managers, which meant that the managers got an email with all the details of what they needed approving, and it was easy to respond to quickly. There was no longer any need for those meetings. So you see, the human side is so important. The idea is really is to increase and maintain user satisfaction with context-sensitive solutions. People want to feel that the business is invested in them and making their lives easier, giving them great tools to do their work so they can work smarter and increase productivity. People like to be productive. Now this has been a really quick overview, but we'll be going into more detail about this and more in our webinars and on our YouTube channel. But I hope this has given you a really good taste for why process automation is so important. Just have a look at these numbers. These are specific to Nintex, and this is from a Forrester report a couple of years ago. They took data from several organisations from a broad range of sectors and sizes. But the figures are really impressive. A massive ROI in a short amount of time, the first year, and a measurable increase in productivity. That's one way of looking at it from a pure numbers point of view, but as I mentioned at the beginning, a decent PA programme can be the cornerstone of your digital transformation giving you the flexibility and agility to maintain a competitive edge in all areas. Now that's something that's really valuable. I'd like to thank you very much for listening. My name's Liam Harrison from IntelliJ. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow IntelliJ on Twitter. You can have a look at our YouTube channel and our blogs on our websites.